1916, 2016 team. Yeah. That was the Baby Bombers. You can't keep calling young Yankees Baby Bombers. Right. So I said Yankee Utes. So you honored uh, my cousin Vinny. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Don. You're a movie aficionado. <laughs> I, I like that. I like that very much. And, yeah, I mean, how did the Baby Bombers totally pan out? So let's start something new. I agree. All right, so the Yankee Utes took over. Wells, Dominguez, the whole deal. All very good first weekends. And they did something that they hadn't done since 2013. They went into Houston, and they gave Houston a problem. They swept them. And by sweeping the Astros, after taking three out of four from the Tigers, and then losing two out of three to Tampa Bay, the Yankees actually went. You, you the, do the math. It's easy. They went seven and three. On a 10-game road trip, which is excellent and so far above what they've played to this point. Now I'm going to get a little bit funky for people. Here we go. I'm going to get people angry. I'm going to get people um, yelling. I'm going to get people, oh, you're living up to the shirt you're wearing, Yankee boy. Here's the dealio, okay? They start a three-game set against the Tigers tonight. The Yankees are now one game uh, under 500. So by sweeping Houston, you actually make it a legitimate chance that they will finish the season over 500. So they have 25 games remaining. Don and Peter, I have mapped out. You ready for this? I have mapped out a path, an unlikely path, a path that probably isn't realistic, a path that's probably um, like the yellow brick road. It's it, This is the Wizard of Oz before the color took over because – all of the analytic uh, websites say that the Yankee chances of making the playoffs happens to be about half a percent. Not what you want, as Joe Girardi would say. No. But there's a way. There is a, there's an avenue, Peter, that I have carved out that it <sighs> might be done. Are you ready? Yeah. Don, are you ready? I, I no, but go ahead. All right, so they're 68 and, and 69. <laughs> they have 25 games remaining. I think 87 or 88 wins will get you the third wild card. So 88 wins, they'd have to go 20 and 5 in their final 25 games. 87, they'd go 19 and 6. All right, so here's where they are right now. The reason why it's it's more doable than, say, the Mets, who actually are closer to a wild card spot in terms of games behind than the Yankees, but the Yankees have to climb over just two teams and then battle for the third spot. The two teams are the Red Sox. They have three games. They're three games behind the Red Sox. Starting on Monday, they have four games left with the Red Sox. They're seven games behind Toronto. They have six games left with Toronto. All right, so if you could somehow clear them, and this is where it becomes very unlikely. If they could actually go 10 and 0 in those games, unlikely, then it becomes very feasible. I'll tell you why. Because then you're going to have to beat out Texas, Houston, or Seattle. <laughs> you said, well, lucky, lucky, keep going. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Right. over to Cuckoo's Nest was a very popular move. Yeah, so yeah, Houston people like insanity. plays yeah. Texas three times. Okay. Houston plays Seattle three times. Okay. And here's where you could sprinkle a little fairy dust into the chance. Okay. So you're telling me there's a chance. Now, before you jump on me, Peter, Don remembers this well. Mm. The Mets had a seven-game lead with 17 left to play. They lost the lead. So the Yankees are eight out, but they have to jump over more teams than the Mets had to lose the seven games. The, the thing that makes it very, very funky, Texas plays Seattle seven times out of the last ten games of the season. So that means that if Houston can win the West, the Yankees need Houston to win the West, and then you have Texas and Seattle continuing to lose. One of them is going to lose every single day out of seven. One of them is losing every day. You keep winning, you're gaining on somebody. Again, I agree with fan graphs. It's about a half a percent chance but you're telling me there's a chance? Yes, there's a little bit of a chance. <sighs> I mean, that was so. We've gone from Cashman and Boone have to go 
they got to reconfigure the lineup, then now you're painting a scenario where you're running this back. Yeah, they may, they may be a bit. Because now you forget about finishing above 500. You're, you're going to make a miracle run to the playoffs. Yeah. They're going to extend Cashman and Boone. Yeah. Well, you got four years left on your Brian, uh, contract, Brian? Let's give you another six. You're not going anywhere. Yeah, after this? And, you know, the other thing that you didn't mention, I don't believe you mentioned in, in what was well, insanity rambling, <laughs> is that the Rangers play the Blue Jays and the Red Sox. So somebody's going to win those games. So somebody you're chasing, Michael, is going to win. Yeah, but And somebody you're chasing is going to no, lose. No, I get it. I'm not saying that if they get hot, Michael, they're not going to pass people. But you brought up the Mets and the Phillies. What happened in in um, in twenty in in two thousand and and six and seven, but it was just the Mets getting uh, falling apart and the Phillies getting hot. Like so, you're asking a lot of teams. Plus, the Rangers have three games coming up against Oakland. Now, Oakland's played a little bit better, but they're still on their way to losing at least a hundred and ten games. But the Rangers can't beat anybody. Well, the, well the, the Rangers came in the City Field, took two out of three from the Mets. It was a bit of a struggle, but, you know, if they can win games against teams that are under 500. I think they can beat the Oakland A's. And if they can't beat the Blue Jays and the Red Sox, Michael, well, then those are two teams that now that they can pass the Rangers, and now it doesn't benefit you because they're winning games. So, Well, the whole idea, I mean, that this is why it's so, again, I'm not predicting it's going to happen. I'm painting a picture where it could. They have to sweep those games against the Red Sox and the Blue Jays. And what's the likelihood of that? Not very good. Well, you're going to have to go. You've won three in a row, right? Right. And you should, at the end of the Tiger series, and you've be won above five or six, yeah. right? And you should be above five hundred. So, yes. destination above five hundred. That should be going into Friday's action against the Brewers, and the Brewers are no push over there in first place in the Central. You got to play four against the Red Sox at Fenway. I beat the Red Sox all year, but if you did beat the Red Sox three at Pittsburgh, they're out of it. And mm -hmm. then the blue. I mean, and, you know, and then you got the Diamondbacks who are still playing for something. And then you got the. And you finished the, the season with the with the Royals. I I I, I thought you were going to come on the air and talk about a scenario of finishing above five hundred. If you remember on Friday when we spoke, Michael Peter, you were off. Oh, what a show! I said, I said if you take two out of three from Houston, I'll have to reconfigure. But I think it's going to be very difficult to finish above five hundred. Not only did you take two out of three, you swept them. So above five hundred, Michael, I think is a real distinct possibility. Yep. Yep. But as far as making up these eight games in 25, day, uh, 25 games to be able to leap over the Red Sox, the Blue Jays, and the Rangers, or the Astros, or the Mariners, depending on what changes, it, that's just too much to expect, Michael. Just way too much to expect. Now, I appreciate what you're doing. All right, there's a chance, but, you know, not going to happen. Hey, he, now, here's the thing where it gets funky, and you, you said it as a pejorative statement, but it's really something to consider. If you ask a Yankee, and we can ask Yankee fans, because you know what? He ha we have the ability to do that. You can actually talk to us. That's the way it works. Yeah. If you're a Yankee fan that hates yourself some Brian Cashman and hates yourself some Aaron Boone, do you want them to finish strong? Because, Don, the best way to elicit any kind of change is for them to have the most miserable season of all time. And I would say that's finishing under 500 for the first time in 30 years and finishing the last place. But if they scratch and claw and finish with 85 wins, does the season have the same stain? Mom. Now, I think it still does because this team was supposed to go to the World Series. But will it be looked at differently by how? Will it be looked at differently by the people they bring in to evaluate well, what's going on? And if Dominguez is the real deal, and Austin Wells is the real deal, and Everson Pereira is the real deal, not saying they are, and, and, and Oswald Peraz is the real deal, and Oswaldo Cabrera is the real deal, do you get an opportunity then to just completely dump on the, on the farm system if they can give you five viable no, you players? Can't. You can't, Michael. Well, first of all, I think Hal Steinbrenner is looking for a reason to run it back with his management. I don't think he wants to fire Boone. I don't think he's, he has any intention of firing Cashman. So finishing above 500 and possibly passing the Red Sox and avoiding last place, you could sell your fan base the fact that our miserable, terrible, awful season still finished above 500, yep. still finished out of last place, and still finished better than the Mets. And then you could also sell them <laughs> so, this, Don. You could sell them, we did it without Judge for two months. Well, that's it, yeah. We did it without Rodon for half the season. I mean, again, these no, are. I think this is what they could sell you. Right. Oh, now, I, I mean, now, who, who I, are they sell? What, well, what, what? This is like this is like where they sell it to the blind kid in Dumb and Dumber who who bought the bird with with duct tape around its neck. 
I mean, come on. Who's buying well, but, but this? They can sell it all they want. But it doesn't. They will sell it because, again, I don't think Hal has any appetite to make any changes. So anything he can grab onto, any traction he can create, he's going to feed off of. And there will be something to it because now there's a reason to go to Yankee Stadium because you want to see these kids play. And then what happened well, in 2016, real. it wasn't enough for them to be able to make the playoffs, but the following year, those baby bombers were a part of a team that came within a whisker going to the World Series. So they'll sell it. It's just a matter of whether the Yankee fan buys it or not. But judging by the reaction this weekend, Michael, yeah, I think the Yankee fans lapping it up because we talked about it on Friday. New York fans love the homegrown. They want to see Dominguez. They want to see Wells. They want to see these kids do well. But can they... Can they swallow the fact that by doing that, you're paying a compliment to Brian Cashman who drafted these guys? Great point. And, and you're, you're now buying into something that you were completely ready to trash five minutes ago. Because you can't compliment Wells and Dominguez and root for them and have a big time September and not pay compliments to Boone and Cashman but, for making it happen. But, okay, but you can, if you are of the thought process that you don't like the way analytics make decisions... This is not the analytic team. This is desperation. And if you read the stories that were written over the last five days, these call-ups were ordered by Hal Steinbrenner. You get Dominguez up. You get Wells up. Let's see what we have. And before that, Pereira, get him up. So this is not a team that the analytics um, portion of the Yankees designed to compete in 2023. So if for some reason these kids go off in a toot now, and they just help the Yankees go off on a run where at the end of the year you look up, they have 85 wins, and they were three games out of a wild card. You could say, hey, our worst isn't that bad, right? So there's there's so many well, layers to this. There just is. There is, but there's also the adage you don't buy into anything that happens in March or September. Yeah. So there's that, too, where we've seen teams get hot. They're the chic pick the next year, and it falls apart. There is something to the fact that the kids are playing well, although it's just three games, but it's a big three games on the road against Houston, a team that owns you. That's something. Um, I, I think it's livened up the veterans and given them a reason to go out and play. Cole said as much how much he's hoping these kids do well. So what was a mundane end to the season, now there's a reason to play. But they are still, even though technically involved in the pennant race mm -hmm. or in a playoff race, they're playing with house money now. And I think that's why that, that's... You, you don't buy into September because we'll see. If this becomes real, Michael, will these kids be able to handle it? Will they all revert back to what happened during the summer when it was for real? It'll be interesting to see down the stretch what they do if they're able to climb back in this thing. Now, and talk about people who want to guzzle the Kool-Aid, right? Mm -hmm. Our producer, Anthony Pusick. A great guy. A, a great guy. A big fan. But an unabashed Yankee fan. Sure. So he sends out a mass text early in the morning, each morning. And this is a line in the text. While well, the Yankees have found the answer in center field for the next 10 years, off of three games. Right. The guy who said shut Judge down right. is now, like, all in. Off three games, he thinks the Yankees have the Martian who has landed and will be here for 10 years. Well, I think he was being sarcastic. No, 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 no. No, that was Anthony. Anthony was a little Yankee pullover. I don't know if he has it on well, today. Well, I tell you what, he's not the only person who is very, very excited. Who else? And no, no, generally, just take a look around. Like, I mean, I think Yankee Nation in general was freaking out about Dominguez. He's got a nickname, too. New Yorkers love nicknames. Well, and I young love young nicknames. Guys. I mean, Taster, uh, you know. For, first, for, listen, first uh, first swing as the Yankees a home run. Two home first runs. swing. First, first swing. swing in the big leagues. That's right. First swing is a home run. Two home runs over the weekend. They sweep their arch rival. I mean, it couldn't have gone any better for Dominguez. And it didn't and go Wells. that badly for Wells. No, quite well. Well, if you will. Now, they, they do have one problem about, like tonight, Garrett Cole's pitching. So Garrett Cole likes to pitch to Ben Roardvet. Okay, I get it. You know, your, your guy gets to make the call. But that doesn't further next year. At some point, and, and Aaron Boone said it today on, on his Talking Yank segment, at some point they are going to have Wells catch Garrett Cole. So I, I don't know if you just set Garrett Cole down after this start and said, we want Wells to catch you, see if he could catch. And do you derail a Cy Young season? You know what I mean? It's a really tough call for them. But is starting Ben Rortvet really the answer for them long term? Or is Austin Wells, who the Yankee organization thinks can hit in the oh. big leagues right now, 
Do you have to see if he catches Garrett Cole the right way? Well, what do you? What is your objective? Like, what is the mission statement tonight? Is the, the mission the statement is, to, is to, to obviously to win a game, but you want to continue. You, uh, the only positive well, thing out of the season is going to be Garrett Cole winning the Cy Young. Yeah, but uh, but ultimately, forget about individual statistics. What you're looking at is, are you trying to grow your kids or are you trying to stay in this thing? Because if you're trying to stay in this thing, give Cole what he wants and go out there and win a game when you're fourth in a row and start building some momentum. If you really want to see the kids, then you then you have Wells and, and have Cole deal with it. So what is the statement? Because you can't, I, in this case, you can't do both. So give Cole the best chance to win. I say let Wells catch because it's the Tigers. I would think Cole would be able to navigate through the Tigers lineup no matter who his backstop is. Yeah, but he's very peculiar with who he's pitching. Right. I mean, he grew up with Kahagashioka, and Kahagashioka doesn't even catch him. Here's here's uh, Boone talking about Wells on the Talking Yanks podcast. All right. Well, Anthony promised that he had it. No hey, way for it. I'm not going to start him today. I'm just going to have him go through all the game planning and stuff with Garrett because I do want him to catch Garrett here down the stretch some. So I do want to incorporate that, but I want him to go through first day at Yankee Stadium, kind of going through all the game planning that and in the meeting with Garrett, all that he goes through. But I know we were really excited about what we saw this weekend from him behind the plate. And just from a presence standpoint, he came in and was prepared. You can tell really enjoys that part of the game, which I think is critical for a catcher. You've got to enjoy the hard, tedious work that you put in and watching video and trying to marry game plans and connecting with that starting pitcher that day. And then obviously the relief pitchers, he showed a lot this weekend to us who got to see it up close and personal for the first time. So excited to see him continue to grow in that role and to see how he, he grows and his connection with the pitching staff uh, as we move forward the rest of the month. But I thought he had a great, great first weekend. We're in the middle of Diamond Notes, brought to you by London Jewelers. One thing I noticed about Wells, I was in the uh, the clubhouse on Saturday. Yeah, this is a rookie. So Friday's his first game, and he did the, first, the same thing on Friday. Dominguez has to show up at the ballpark, look at video of the pitcher they're going to face, and work out a game plan how he's going to attack them. Wells, that's secondary. Wells was sitting down with Luis Severino for about 35 minutes in the middle of the clubhouse going over everything. He can't even concentrate on his hitting. So the fact that he has two RBIs already, a couple of hits, had a double on Sunday, that bodes well. It seems like he has a way about him. And Peter mentioned this earlier. One thing that I noticed over the weekend, they're much looser. Now, you could say, well, they're looser because of the fact everything's, everything's over. It's done with. I mean, they're just playing out the stretch. Or kids sometimes bring a lightness to a situation in life and in sports. So if you bring a couple of, you know, five kids into the locker room, all of a sudden, all they care about is the joy of playing, and this is the this is their dream being realized, and all the veterans then get caught up in it. Uh, now, you could say that the reason they're winning is because of the kids, but that's not true either. They won three out of four in Detroit before the kids. What's happening is they're getting betting, better starting pitching. Starting pitching is going to win you games, and I think the best thing they've done since Brian Cashman came out and said this season's a disaster is move Michael King into the starting rotation. So yesterday, uh, Sunday, he gave him five innings. He's going to get up to a seven-inning starter by the end of the year. He should be one of their five starters next year. It's easier to find people in the bullpen. I know he's extraordinary in the bullpen. This guy's got the pitch selection and the talent to be a number three starter in the big leagues. That should be their plan moving forward. They're going to need starters. Montas isn't coming back. Severino's not coming back. You know Cole is back. You don't have any idea about Nestor Cortez. He's out with a rotator cuff problem. So who's going to be your starting rotation? Clark Schmidt's probably in there, and Michael King as well. And you hope that Rodon is fully healthy next year, and he's one of your starters. But I think that's one of the smartest things they've done is transition Michael King into a starting role because I think he could be very, very good at it. I, I just want to remind everyone that in case you think we're only doing fantasy work today, like Dungeons and Dragons and different kind of fantasy games, we're going to talk about real football starting at 4 o'clock. I just want oh, to we're talking about real baseball now. No, no, we're talking Yay! fantasy. We're playing shoots and ladders right now. We're playing oh, fantasy. Well, who who, didn't, who well, didn't enjoy shoots and ladders? No, we all did. And, but guess what? And I enjoyed, when I was busy over the weekend, I was traveling, I followed along with John Boy and Talking Yanks, every, every great at bat. It's cool stuff. It's fun. The kids. Yeah, the Utes. Yankee Utes. I dig it. But, like, 
Hey, look, can we get back to reality? Well, I want to see the fan base that has been so negative, not just this year, but for half of last year, how they feel about it. Do they I don't think they into, like it. Do they I don't buy think they like Michael? it. We'll see. And we'll talk to them when oh. we get back. Those are Diamond Notes brought to you by London Jewelers, the English.